Okay, good day, everyone. From the International Trade Center at the Women's Business Development Center in Chicago on Michigan Avenue. I see that the uh, people are joining. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll begin. Okay, you know what, let's start. So again, welcome to our webinar today, how to export, and we're gonna focus on freight forwarding. And uh, we'll talk, we'll call this one Freight Forwarder 101. First, let me uh, take a minute to, to introduce everybody who's involved. I'm located at the Women's Business Development Center in Chicago. The Women's Business Development Center is a very well-known, well-established nonprofit um, based in downtown Chicago that's been around uh, since 1986. And the focus of the WBDC is to strengthen and support women's business as well as minority business, as well as uh, veterans businesses. And um, got a full staff there that are devoted to helping these businesses grow. And now the International Trade Center is just another item on the menu to, for these businesses to, uh, to grow. So, also at the WBDC, we have what's called an Illinois Small Business Development Center. So that's for your domestic business. And there's a lot of help uh, and information available there about your business. If you wanna do some research or somebody to talk over your business plan with you, talk about funding. Uh, I'd suggest if you haven't looked at the WBDC before, have a look at their programming. There's a lot of great programming there, most of it for free that uh, may be able to help your business. Also, there's what's called a PTAC, which is a, a, a group within our organization that helps with government, sell, selling the government, whether it's the city, whether it's the county, whether it's federal or the airport. We've got people that can help, help you navigate government sales as well. So I manage the ITC, the International Trade Center there, and uh, we provide export advice to help you if you're starting out to export or you're already doing it and you want to grow. And uh, note that the ITC is at the WBDC is an extension of the state of Illinois Office of Trade and Investment. We've got clients within the WBDC across the, uh, across the state, as well as clients that are not part of that organization across the Chicago area. What we can do at the ITC to help you is just talk about your export readiness. Are you, are you ready to go? We can help you develop an export plan. We can talk strategy. We can talk channel and channel uh, construction. We can help you with uh, do some market research for you and help you identify target markets, target segments, um, and help you analyze that information. We can talk about shipping and logistics as we're doing today. We can talk about payments and credit insurance and grants. And the main thing is, okay, I'm a one-man band at the International Trade Center, but I've got a network of people behind me, uh, an expert network behind me that I can connect you with. So my, my background is 30 years of private sector experience as a manager of international sales or a director of international sales for um, several American companies. And uh, this took me across a lot of different businesses, commercial markets, industrial markets all over the world. I've lived in different parts of the world. I've worked pretty much everywhere you can imagine and been every place you can think of. And I think this helps me with help uh, with growing your business. I'm uh, born and raised in Chicago and a lot of uh, background in the international trade community in Chicago, which we, um, which we think can help you. So I wanna note that the state of Illinois supports exporting. Again, we work hand in hand with the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois has uh, what's called the Office of Trade and Investment. They've got an office downtown with very capable people there, as well as six offices around the world. And their, their role, their function is to help you export or grow your exports. And typically the state of Illinois uh, services are all free. So feel free to reach out to us. We'll connect you with them. And uh, again, to answer questions or to help you get your exports started. Last point is grants. 
we can help you with that as well. What's called I-STEP grants. These are grants from the state of Illinois. In general, if your product is made in Illinois, uh, there's money available that can subsidize trade missions you might want to go on, trade shows, product compliance work, website localization fees. So there is money out there to help you. So keep that in mind and we'll, can, we'll help you navigate that to uh, the, the grant game, right? Uh, typically or additionally, there's grants available from the Illinois uh, Department of Agriculture. Additionally, if you're in the food market, the food sector, there's a good amount of money available there. Let's move on. Okay, let's go to today's uh, webinar is Freight Forwarding 101. We'll give an overview of the freight forwarding process in the overall export process. And let's talk really specifically what a freight forward can do for you and what they don't do. This is part one of a two-part program. The second part of this, Freight Forwarding 201, will come up on February 22nd, 12 noon Central Time. Today, we have Paul Jerzombek of LR International as our expert speaker. Uh, I've known LR International for a long time. They're one of the leading forwarding companies in the Midwest. They're Chicago-based or Chicago area-based, very experienced with international issues, very prominent in the international trade community in this region. So we've got somebody uh, today that's really an expert and knows, um, knows their stuff. So we'll go through this presentation and then uh, we'll cover Q&A as best we can. We're looking to be done with this by one o'clock in one hour. So let's proceed. Let me uh, let Paul take over and I will back out from here. Great, thanks, Bill. Really appreciate it. And I'm very uh, glad and honored to be here, everybody. I'm just gonna pull up the presentation for today that we're gonna use and uh, get that queued up here. And, um, and then we'll begin. Uh, whoops, there we go. That's the start of it. So as Bill said, uh, my company is LR International. We are based in Franklin Park, Illinois, just two miles east of O'Hare Airport uh, here in Chicago. We are a global logistics company, and uh, I'll explain um, what that means exactly uh, as we go along uh, in the presentation. Uh, this is a shot of our uh, website. You can find us at lrinternational.com if you're interested. Um, you know, this slide talks about our group of companies. Um, you know, when I first got into the business 30 years ago, so my background is uh, I've been in free forwarding and logistics my entire career about 30 years ago, right out of college, and I got an internship with a logistics company. It was a um, European-based uh, logistics company, actually headquartered in the Netherlands. And uh, the focus of that business was consolidating ocean freight cargo um, and moving it around the world. So we had heavy warehousing operations. There was also a um, a uh, bulk chemical side to that business where we moved a lot of uh, hazardous material, dangerous goods. Uh, but our primary focus was on helping companies that had smaller ocean freight shipments um, achieve a cost-effective way of moving that cargo around the world. And the way we did that is we would take their shipments and combine them with other companies' shipments, also smaller shipments, one pallet, two pallets, three crates, that sort of thing, combine them, and then make one big shipment, uh, let's say from China to Germany or from the U.S. to Australia or, or, or that sort of thing. So that was a European-based company. I had an internship with them out of college, and then they, I must have done something right because they called me when I was graduating and said, do you want a job? Of course, being a poor college student, I said, absolutely, I want a job. I don't even think I asked what the job was. I just said, yes. Um, and I started uh, my career. A few years later, I went to a large Japanese company, Hitachi. You may be familiar with that company. They make a lot of different products, including uh, big TVs and earth moving equipment and all sorts of things. A long established Japanese company. And I ran their um, distribution facility and operation in the Midwest here in Chicago and was supporting not only the Hitachi group business, which was all of those uh, Japanese products and, and how they uh, either came into the United States or exported out of the United States, uh, but also was able to work with other customers uh, that I had uh, and do their business as well, not just the Hitachi business. So that was a large corporation that I was part of. And uh, that, that was a really great experience uh, working for 
a Japanese company. And that prepared me for where I've now been for the last uh, 26 years. Um, and that is as a partner with LR International, which is an American freight forwarding company. When I first got into the business, you could specialize in certain things, um, just do export, just do import, just do air freight or just do ocean freight. Now freight forwarders have to do everything, um, much like the rest of the world. When you go to the supermarket, you not only want to buy your groceries, but you want to get the tires changed on your car and you want to have lunch. And, you know, uh, those hypermarkets have evolved um, into doing a, a wide range of things. And consumers today, whether it's on, on the business side or the consumer side, have expectations that you can do, do it all. And so we, as a company, have had to, over the last 33 years, we're in our 33rd year of operation, we've had to evolve into doing a wide variety of things, import, export, air freight, ocean freight, domestic, um, you know, customs brokerage, the consulting on the export side, specialized documentation. So we have different groups here within our business, subsets of our business, that um, do those things all under one roof uh, and one sort of parent company which is LR International. This is a little more about what we do. Um, we've been recognized on the state and federal level with E awards, uh, which just means the government thinks we're doing a good job. Um, and um, that, that's what that's about. We serve on some boards, uh, uh, board, of the, board of directors of some uh, trade organizations throughout the Midwest. We do a lot of teaching and training like, like we're doing today um, on export Methods of payment and so forth. It's not a commercial for my company. This is the last is to help you understand uh, that the, um, this slide helps it form. There's there's a lot of things that happen. Uh, this slide boils it as the exporter in the upper left hand corner there. So you are either manufacturing or buying and selling products. You're an exporter from the United States to somewhere around the world to a customer somewhere around the world. It could even be Canada or Mexico right here connected to us in North America. And that's the importer. And there's usually a contract or an agreement between the two of you that says the exporter is going to supply certain products in certain quantities, certain quality for a certain price. And the importer is going to pay and is going to usually be involved in the import process um, on the other side, wherever, wherever that country is. Uh, the freight forwarder in the lower left-hand corner there, uh, that's, that's an old shot, a shot of our old website homepage. Um, the freight forwarder is a partner, uh, typically to the exporter, um, in arranging and uh, booking freight services and a wide variety of other services if the exporter needs them to get the goods from the US to wherever overseas. The freight forwarder does that um, with a variety of partners and relationships, but some of the biggest ones are with carriers. Carriers, like in the middle of the screen there at the bottom, carriers are the companies that actually fly the planes, steer the ships, drive the trucks, and uh, negotiate the rail uh, service, both here and abroad. So carriers um, are airlines like American Airlines or Lufthansa or Alitalia or you name it, or steamship lines like Maersk, which is the the Danish steamship line that is the largest in the world. When you see all of those containers, you're at a railroad, you know, you're, you're at a, a railroad crossing and there's a really long train with all these containers double stacked on them and you need to get somewhere in a hurry and you're cursing under your breath. You can thank me for that. Um, and all of the other freight forwarders out there um, who are arranging those rail services, typically from an interior part of the United States to a port where those containers are then taken off, they're unloaded from that double stack and put onto a ship like the one on the screen uh, in front of you. That's, that's a shot at a port where a vessel is in a berth and then those cranes over the top 
load the containers onto the ship. And on the other side, in the other country where your customer is, they have a customs broker. Uh, that happens to be there in that picture uh, on the lower right. Um, one of our partners in Germany in, in, their, in his Munich office, his name is Tim. He's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for 25 years. And um, they represent the importer in their country. Now, this is an export program, but it's important for you to know that what you're doing on this side is mirrored to some degree on the import side in the other country. They have a, uh, an agent or a company like mine uh, in their country that helps them navigate clearing goods through customs and ultimately getting them delivered uh, to the final destination. So a customs broker and a freight forwarder uh, do similar functions, but on opposite sides of the transaction. Most freight forwarders are also customs brokers. Back to that point that um, you kind of have to do everything today uh, in the market that we're in. Some details about the role of the freight forward. And if you have questions as we go, certainly uh, type them into the chat. I know Bill's gonna be uh, monitoring that. And uh, you know we'll either take them right then and there because it makes sense to do that. Or we'll hit them at the end. Um, so don't be afraid to you know, jump in and, and answer or ask uh, questions and we'll make. The big thing you should know is that a freight forwarder um, operates with what we call two masters in our business. One master is the exporter. We become a flexible extension of that exporter's export department. Um, in some cases, the companies that we do work for are, let's say, small to medium sized and maybe don't have a, a complete department of people working on their exports. In other cases, we work with multinational corporations that do have full blown departments. But freight forwarders serve an important function for either because freight forwarders have a, a license and authority to make bookings on behalf of exporters with carriers. And there's a whole Okay, everybody. There we go. Paul, you're freezing up there for for uh, ten seconds or so. Goes into making those bookings with the free. Hey, Bill, can you hear me now? Yeah, you know what? You broke up a little bit, uh, you know, for Sorry. 10 or 15 seconds. I <laughs> lost your, um, yeah, but I lost your uh, screen. Okay, I'll uh, see if I can't get back in it here. Sorry, everybody. A uh, little technical difficulty there, but let's see. Uh, are we back there, Bill? Yep. Okay. Sorry, everybody. So um, back to role of the freight forwarder. Uh, freight forwarders serve two masters. We're an agent for the exporter. We're also an agent for carriers. We have to make sure both parties are happy um, and, and that we're doing our job for both parties. You have to have a good relationship with carriers. Otherwise, they won't give you preferential treatment on space and on rates. So we work for the exporter, but we have to have a good relationship with carriers at the same time. Uh, we're a logistics planning partner as a freight forwarder. Uh, we're helping you plan for your exports. That's critical. We don't. We don't. We really don't want to be dealing with a problem um, late in the process. Assuming you know about a particular challenge or issue, we'd really like to be talking with you. You know, as far in advance as we can, especially in today's environment with COVID nineteen limited carrier uh, space and equipment. So the earlier, the better. Uh, we consult on all matters of export because we have to export compliance, packing, um, different shipping modes, methods of payment. How are you gonna get paid for your exports? We, we tend to get involved in those uh, discussions and may interact with your bank or other providers. Problem solving is what we do all day long. Uh, moving the freight we say is actually the easy part. 
Um, you know, you make bookings with carriers. There's a process, many data elements and documents that go into this. But problem solving for our clients is where we really earn our keep as a freight forwarder. Uh, we're a liaison between you, the exporter, and other service providers that help you. And I mentioned some like banks and, and uh, the federal government, and in some cases, even the state government here in Illinois. So we're a liaison. We move cargo. That's our main core competency is, is shipping cargo. That's what we do. Uh, we certainly get involved in a lot of documents, um, and we assist you in preparing documents. We have to prepare documents when shipments move around the world. Uh, it's actually a, a document heavy process. A lot of it has been moved to um, e-documents, which is great, but there's still documents and you still have to fill, fill in the data elements and so forth. We provide warehousing and distribution both here and abroad if needed for our clients. Cargo insurance is a big thing in our business. So three things I want you to take away from today's program, if nothing else, one is um, how a freight forwarder and having a good freight forwarder or maybe a few good freight forwarders can really make your life a lot easier as an exporter and keep you out of trouble. That's number one. Number two is take control of your exports. When we get to talking about income terms or trade terms, um, we want you to have control of the shipping at least to your overseas customers port or airport in their country and let them handle the import process. Um, there are many reasons for that, but in my 30 years of experience, I have found that when customers are in control of moving their exports, the entire process goes better. They have less um, compliance issues and um, we make sure that they get paid for all of their export orders, which is a, a big concern. And uh, when you control the shipping, you have leverage. So. Uh, knowing uh, how a freight forwarder can help you and, and um, obtaining some good freight forwarder relationships if you don't have them already is number one. Number two is control your exports um, to the overseas airport or ocean port. And then the last thing I want you to take away from today is always insure. Um, a lot of people will look at cargo insurance and think it's optional. I will tell you in 30 years of doing this, your shipments should always be insured because carriers are not careful. They will damage your product without thinking twice. They have limits of liability that when they damage or lose your goods, they basically have no responsibility, uh, no financial responsibility for that. And if you don't have cargo insurance in place, you will just lose the value of your goods. Um, sounds crazy, that's not the way the rest of the world works, but it is the way the, uh, in the uh, shipping industry works. And I can talk a little more about that later. A few more things about um, freight forwarder services. We really get involved in a lot of parts of the process. Um, some of them are a little more complicated than uh, this particular program uh, warrants discussing. We are doing another program, as, as Bill mentioned, Freight Forwarding 201 in February, and we'll cover a couple of these things in more detail. But there are some things there that you'll see that that we are either do we either do these things directly as a freight forwarder or we, um, we have some involvement or some dotted line connection uh, to these various, um, these various services. Um, now, I also put a slide in about customs brokers because um, even though this is an export program and we're talking about working with your freight forwarder, the customs broker services on the other side um, overseas can also be very important depending on which INCO term you've decided to sell under. Uh, you also have to know what your customer is dealing with on their side. You, you may not have any responsibility for it, but knowing what they have to do uh, on their side of the equation just helps you prepare the export a little better or maybe be a little more sympathetic to some of their requests to finalize the order. Plus, if you're an exporter, you will likely be an importer at one point or another, because when you export, uh, invariably you have either items that are gonna be returned, uh, maybe they have to be repaired or replaced, and um, return shipments are fairly typical, uh, occasionally at least, even for companies that don't have any 
uh, real commercial imports to speak of, but are exporting. So we're not going to talk about a customs broker and how they can help you in this program because we're talking about exports and freight forwarder. But I thought it was important for you to know that a customs broker um, operates very similar, uh, similarly to the way a freight forwarder operates, but on the import side instead of the export side. Let's talk about INCO terms for a moment. Um, trade terms or INCO terms are a critical piece of the export process and a critical part in working with your freight forwarder. Um, if you choose an INCO term that puts you in a position where you're not able to choose the freight forwarder, your customer overseas is, um, you may have more complications. Uh, this is something that's, that can happen. Again, it depends on the term. But one of my three points that I really wanted you to remember was uh, working to take control of your export orders. Um, and that usually means choosing the right INCO term. Now, INCO terms were developed back in the 30s. They're international trade terms. They're acronyms that are designed to help all parties in the transaction know what role everyone is playing. To put it plainly, INCO terms define who's paying the freight and how far, who's responsible to move the goods from what point until what point. Um, so INCO terms are not necessarily a, an indicator of title transfer on your goods. They can be, if your sales contract uh, essentially defaults to the INCO term that you've chosen, then title of your goods will transfer just as the INCO term dictates. But you could have a sales contract where the title of your goods does not transfer in line with the INCO term. So really INCO terms are more about the shipping services and who's responsible to what point and who pays for the various shipping costs from a door-to-door -door perspective. Um, INCO terms are revised about every 10 years. The last revision was 2020. The one before that was 2010. There are 11 total INCO terms. We're not gonna talk about those 11 today because INCO terms can be a program unto itself, and, and we can talk about INCO terms for, for several hours, really. It's, it's a, you know, they're a somewhat complicated topic when you look at all 11 terms. Um, but there are four groups of INCO terms, the E group, the F group, the C group, and the D group. And for today, what I want you to know is the E and the F groups, those terms um, have you, the exporter in the US, responsible for some activity here in the US on this side of the international transaction. The C and the D terms have you responsible for something overseas, either getting the freight to the overseas country, the port or the airport, or getting it, getting the freight there and uh, some in-country responsibilities on the other side. And you might be thinking, well, good, this is great. The best thing for me to do is manufacture my goods or, or procure them and then sell them to clients around the world and use an E or an F term and let, let the customer overseas deal with the freight because that's not, my, that's not what I'm good at. I'm good at making my widgets or, or what have you. And uh, I take on extra risk and burden if I ship things overseas and I don't really know how to do that. So I'm not gonna do it. And that would be a logical um, way of looking at it. But what I can tell you is um, I've been doing this for a long time. And my opinion is, except for very specific instances, that's the exact wrong thing to do. Um, the best thing to do is to choose, we recommend a C term. Uh, this is a, a reference chart. It's a little blurry here, but it's actually, you can find it on our website as well if you go to the um, the Learning Center, it's called on our website. And this isn't specific to us. The International Chamber of Commerce produces this chart and many companies have uh, uh, branded it um, on their own. Um, 
And what this chart does is it, it tells you with each INCO term of the 11, what the buyer's responsibility is and what the seller's responsibility is. So if you're an exporter here in the US, you're the seller and uh, it will tell you what you're responsible for, okay? Um, let's see what my next slide is, yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna go back here a second. We'll come back to that chart in a minute. But the C terms, uh, if you choose a C term and there's four of them, okay? So two for air, uh, two, two for ocean and two for every other uh, mode of transport. You choose a C term. What you've done with your exports is you've told your customer overseas, we will arrange the shipping to your port, ocean port or airport in your country uh, that you choose. If, if you tell us uh, you're in Japan and you say, I want the port of Yokohama, or I want uh, Tokyo Narita Airport in Japan, then we will get the freight to that ocean port or airport. And then when it arrives, you, the customer, have to do all the customs clearance and get it to your ultimate location in Japan, for that example. In our experience as a freight forwarder, that is the best term for exporters to use because, uh, for a variety of reasons really, you have some um, input on the freight charges when you, when you use that term. You have better visibility to and control over the actual movement of the goods. You can work with your freight forwarder on different schedules and um, you know, potentially different goals and objectives as far as deadlines and, and getting things uh, where they need to be. Plus, if something goes wrong or sideways, which absolutely happens, um, your freight forwarder is doing the work for you, and a solution is um, more readily available. And, and regardless of INCO terms, and if any of you, if you're in business, you know that no matter whether the customer has set something up or not, if something goes wrong, they want your help to fix it. And so usually when you pick a C term, you're in a position to help the customer if along the way a shipment gets delayed or, or there's some issue. Um, and C terms give you the ability to um, control some of those things, but it allows the customer to handle the import process in their country, which is really better for them to do because they are a company in their country and you're a company in this country here in the US. So it, in our opinion is the best set of terms. I like when exporters are willing to take control of shipments uh, overseas because uh, they have direct control over the compliance requirements. And this is a big point. Most newer to export companies, which we work with a lot, um, are unaware of the fact that our government has what are called the export administration regulations, which are laws uh, and rules and regulations that all exporters have to follow, no matter what the INCO term uh, chosen is. So if your customer overseas says, don't worry, we're going to pick the order up from your facility. You don't have to do anything. Just supply the product to us. We'll pay you for it. Um, even if it's prepaid from your door. You as the exporter of record, your company here in the U.S., still has all of the compliance responsibilities uh, to our federal government, to the U.S. federal government. And there are many um, compliance points. We're not gonna go through them today because this is more of an introductory program. But those compliance points can be very expensive. If any of those points are missed, even though you are not controlling the shipping, you as the export of records still get the fines or penalties uh, associated with it. It's kind of like when you do your taxes, if your accountant screws up, uh, you're the party that's filing the taxes. So the government says, we're gonna, we're gonna penalize you. We don't care if you had a preparer and they did a bad job, you should have had a better preparer. Uh, you're gonna get the finer penalty. So um, variety of reasons uh, to control the shipping. It's one of my three critical points today, um, but C terms and even D terms help you do that. So they're the better terms. Again, this is the chart. You can find it on our website and also a variety of places. You can Google INCO term chart or quick reference guide and you will see it. And um, that will help you with those individual terms. So INCO term selection is really an important part to the export process. 
talking a little bit about documentation. Uh, Bill, are we still okay, or did you want to take any questions right now, or should I keep going? No, let's keep going. I'm, I'm looking at the questions, and we'll cover them at the end. No problem. Uh, let's talk a little bit about documentation. Um, you know, they say the shipment's never done until the documents are done. So you can do everything right, but uh, if the documents are not correct, there's usually a problem. But why is that? Well, you know, documentation is how every government um, clears shipments or approves goods to come into the commerce of that country. And the United States is the same. So even though most custom services nowadays, whether it's overseas or here in the US, are operating on an electronic customs platform, which they are, data elements are keyed into the system and driven into the customs portals or custom systems, and then customs officers are reviewing that data, they still often will ask to see the physical documentation, the actual papers, whether it's a commercial invoice, a packing list, a transport document, a manifest, um, those documents will typically underwrite the electronic process uh, that a customs broker, as an example, would, would enter into. So documentation is a critical piece. This slide is designed to show you the shared responsibility uh, as it relates to documentation. You can see that you, you the exporter in the middle there, um, either have direct responsibility for quite a bit of documentation or shared responsibility with your freight forwarder or with your customer overseas. Uh, so documentation is something that we as a freight forwarder are working with all the time. We're coaching our clients on even down to certain countries, what they want to see. You know, Documentation for import into Saudi Arabia is different than it is in Mexico, is different than it is in New Zealand. Uh, some of the properties are the same, but nuances to that documentation uh, can be different. It's our job as a freight forwarder to know the nuances and to help you as the exporter prepare your documents uh, in a way that's going to avoid delays once the goods get overseas. So documentation is also a program we could do all on its own um, because there's, there's a lot there to unpack. But suffice it to say that we as freight forwarders are experts in international documentation, the requirements, um, and we coach our export clients in this area often. Um, if, if, they're a, if they're a very experienced exporter, we don't have to do a lot of coaching. They've, they've, they've lived it, and so we don't have to. But um, at the end of the day, uh, we are experts in that area. Little more on logistics and risk mitigation. Um, you know, exporting uh, will help you um, go after 95% of the world's uh, business opportunities. The US represents about 5% of the global business opportunity. So if you're, if you're located here in the United States and you're only selling to US companies, there is a whole big market out there uh, interested probably in what you're selling. And of course there are, um, there are uh, some deals that are better than others, some, some customers and situations that are more attractive, uh, but exporting does carry with it risks, direct risks as far as uh, your product getting there in good order, payment risk and compliance risk. Uh, cargo insurance, which is one of my big three, so know and work with qualified freight forwarders and understand how they can help you control your export shipments, primarily through the selection of the correct INCO term, and then insure, always insure. I have clients somewhat regularly talk to me about this and what about this, what about that? Do I really need to insure it? My answer is, look, I've been doing this a long time. Carriers are not careful and they will ruin your stuff and they won't care one bit about it because they're not measured on how nicely they handle your cargo. They're measured more by how, how much they can maximize their planes or ships as far as how full they are, so they make money, how quickly they can get in and out of ports or airports, because when you sit at a port or an airport too long, it costs a lot of money. So time and speed and, and volume capacity, maximizing capacity are what carriers are all about. If your stuff gets damaged and you work really hard to get that export order, they won't care one bit. And they're not 
going to compensate you because when you agree to work with a carrier shipping internationally, you probably unbeknownst to you, you, you agree automatically. It's kind of like those, those, those uh, terms and conditions from company like, companies like Apple where you just said, I agree. You, uh, you agree, whether you realize it or not, to their terms and conditions, which include limits of liability that they have. And those limits of liability are basically nothing. So uh, it's, it's very important that you ensure your shipments. You can do that through your freight forwarder. Uh, virtually all freight forwarders are also cargo insurance agents. And uh, you can do it like that, or you can get your own cargo insurance policy. It's not your standard general liability policy that has shipping covered. That's domestic. Uh, there are many um, deficiencies in domestic shipping policies when it, when it comes to the international side of the business. And we can talk more maybe in the 201 program about specific coverages for cargo insurance. But for today, I want you to know, always insure. Here's some reasons why you want to insure. These slides are um, pretty cool because they, they do show uh, things that happen somewhat regularly, to be honest. I mean, uh, if it can happen, we say in our business, it probably will at one point or another. Um, you know, we, we've had um, different instances of uh, damage or cargo claims. Fortunately at our company, our claim record is very, very low. Uh, we average somewhere between seven and 8,000 transactions a month. I mean, I'm sorry, a year rather, pardon me. Um, and uh, we usually have five or less cargo claims a year, um, but they do happen. Um, you know, this is a slide where a container went overboard. They were able they were able to actually capture it during a storm. That is sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And, um, um, you know, in some cases, um, there will be such bad weather that a captain of a ship, a cargo ship, will actually instruct the crew to release a certain section of cargo containers overboard to stabilize the ship. The captain is so worried the ship is gonna capsize that he looks at the load plan and says, release all the containers in position 22. Um, and, and they take the, the uh, cables off of them and let them go into the ocean because the, the captain's more worried about the whole ship sinking. That can happen. So that's called a general average or general salvage claim. Again, these are insurance terms and we can talk maybe more about them in the, in the 201 program. But let me just tell you that insurance is important because if something like this happens, you have a container that goes to the bottom of the ocean and you have cargo insurance in place, you will be compensated for the value of your shipment and the shipping charges that you would be paying. If you don't have cargo insurance, you're not gonna be compensated for it, simple as that. Happens on the air freight side as well. Um, and you know, little things when they happen, uh, the, the aircraft have to be taken out of service, completely reinspected, um, and uh, you lose time. Your cargo has to be offloaded, which means it has to be handled again, put on a different flight. Uh, in today's environment with COVID, air freight is under tremendous strain because um, passenger flights also carry cargo. And so the reduced passenger flights because of the coronavirus um, and, and countries not wanting as many visitors and so forth has, um, has created a, a real space constraint environment for the last year on the air freight side. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of pictures about cargo that freight forwarders handle. I've got about maybe five more minutes here and then we'll open it up to questions. This is a 72,000 pound engine uh, that we were moving, uh, believe it or not, by air freight to uh, the Central Independent States, Kazakhstan for a customer of ours, GE. Uh, so we had to use our mobile crane to reposition this piece in our warehouse. Uh, we had to do some, some dangerous goods um, uh, refurbishing on this piece, some, some uh, draining of, uh, of hazardous fluids. And then uh, we also did some packing and crating on it uh, before it was exported by air. So it was a, it's a very heavy piece that we handled in our Franklin Park facility. Um, this is a heat exchanger that we did for Cargill coming out of Austria. So this was an import transaction, but I wanted you to see the type of trucking equipment here that we had to use. Uh, this is a 130,000 pound piece. So uh, we have to use a trailer that um, distributes that weight across a long 
area in order to be legal under permit. You can't, you can't move this legally without a permit and you have to get a permit from every state in the United States uh, that you would be moving through. We moved this from New Jersey to Nebraska uh, for Cargill. Uh, we also did the import from Austria when we did it. Uh, this uh, shipment was for uh, Johnson Controls and it was um, a uh, firefighting uh, compressed tank for an airport um, in uh, the Virgin Islands. Um, and this was in the winter, we, we had the tank come in and we had to load an ocean freight container. As you can see, that's an open top ocean freight container. So um, it, it's the top is open and then we put a tarp uh, over the top, we secure the tarp. Um, once we've got the cargo loaded into the container, it's about a 40,000 pound tank there. So we had to use our mobile crane and load it in from the top and then put the top on. And of course, secure that tank inside the container so it doesn't come crashing out the back doors uh, in transit. Just some unique uh, shipments there. How do you choose a freight forwarder? Um, a lot like you choose any other vendor, look at your size and their size. Often, um, you know, uh, if you're doing a lot of high volume exporting, uh, sometimes it's beneficial to connect with a larger freight forwarder that uh, can more easily handle those high volume shipments. Maybe you're not looking for individual service as much as you are uh, a really good platform and technology to exchange information with that larger forwarder uh, on an EDI or, or other basis, and that can be good. Conversely, if you're a smaller exporter, you may wanna work with a slightly smaller freight forwarder that will provide uh, more hands-on uh, consulting type services. So that's that's a consideration, certainly global coverage. No freight forwarder is wonderful in their services to everywhere. Any freight forwarder that tells you that is not telling the truth. So there can be some areas where a freight forwarder is certainly competent, but not spectacular. And so there may even be, you know, the need to have a couple of freight forwarders um, to help you with your exports. And that's common. So nothing wrong with that. Of course, it's down to relationships. Um, just like with any supplier, uh, you feel like you have a good response time, a good connection with your freight forwarder, and you should. And you should meet with your freight forwarder, even in the COVID environment, if it's, uh, if it's um, um, through a virtual process. I would say at least once a quarter, once a month might even be better uh, because there are a lot of, as I mentioned, compliance responsibilities that the forwarder um, has that they work with for you on your behalf. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you look at those things when you're choosing a freight forwarder. My company, uh, we operate all over the world. We're in our 33rd year of operation. Um, we certainly have seen and done a lot uh, there. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we like to think we're one of the, the better freight forwarders out there, but there are quite a few good freight forwarders out there. There are certainly a large number of what I would call um, marginal freight forwarders. Um, and you want to be careful. You want to work with an established company that is doing business regularly in the area that, that you want to do it in. So um, that's that. And with that, um, uh, Bill, I'd be happy to, with you, entertain any questions. Yeah, Paul, thanks for that. And uh, I, I must say, the, uh, we will, your, your, your note about keeping control of the exports and uh, mm -hmm. under sea terms was, was a good point. And that's something I think we'll dive into more the next session and, uh, and, and sort of run an example of that because that's really best practice. Let me, let me touch on a couple of things. Um, Paul, we've got some companies that are you know, not shipping containers, right? Like at what point do they use a UPS or a FedEx? And then at one point do they, so to speak, graduate to a pallet? They've got a pallet of goods. Is that when they'll contact a freight forwarder? How would you, uh, how do you how, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. You know, the, the, the UPS, FedEx, DHLs of the world, they, they um, master the small package, the movement of small packages, both domestically and around the world. And they are very good at it. They're highly uh, technology-driven companies, as, as all of us know, especially with the coronavirus and, and uh, maybe not going out and, uh, let's say, shopping for things in person as much, but ordering online. So those, uh, what we call integrated carriers, that's your UPS, FedEx, DHL. They're very good at small package shipping. So typically the threshold is 
a package or packages up to around, I'd say 50 to 75 pounds, maybe even 100 pounds, uh, those integrated carriers are going to be cost effective, have very good service, um, and you're going to be able to track and get information pretty easily. Uh, when you get above 75 to 100 pounds, certainly in the pallet of freight range, as you mentioned, Bill, then a freight forwarder is going to become more cost effective and is going to have a wider range of services. Don't forget UPS, DHL, and FedEx, they are also carriers. That's why we call them integrated carriers. They use their own planes and their own services, and that's great. But if we're going to an area of the world where it would be better to use uh, another service that's out there, uh, like uh, Nippon Cargo Airlines to Japan, as an example, then uh, it might be better to work with a freight forwarder. So a general rule of thumb, you know, 75 to 100 pounds and greater, freight forwarder is probably going to be the uh, best way to go. Do you handle, in, in a case like that, okay, I've got a pallet, do you handle the consolidation of, of that pallet with, with other cargo heading to a particular destination? Yes, freight forwarders are, are doing consolidations, as Bill mentioned, so grouping uh, a variety of, of exporters' cargo together as one master consignment or one master shipment, we call it. Do that on a regular basis all the time to every destination around the world or just about every destination. There are some uh, points in Africa or, or, or Latin America or Asia where the ability to consolidate is still there, but it's not a weekly thing or on the air freight side, even a daily thing uh, because they're not high volume locations. But let's just say for 98% of the world, yes, uh, we, we combine um, pallets and crates. What's nice about consolidations, you only pay for the space you use. So if you have one pallet at 200 pounds, you're only paying for one pallet at 200 pounds in that ocean container or that air freight container. Um, and everybody else who's involved in that shipment is paying for whatever space and, and weight they're taking up. So it's a pay-as-you-go program. It's, it's a good program. How about, um, does every freight forwarder, or is every freight forwarder also a customs broker? So anymore today, I would say 99% of freight forwarders are also customs brokers. Again, because the demand from the shipping public is there to do pretty much everything. You know, when we first started our business at LR, we were 95% export and 95% air freight. Today, we're 60% ocean freight and about 65% export. Uh, plus we do domestic and rail moves and, and so on and so forth. So the industry has changed quite a bit. The answer is almost all are. There may be a few freight forwarders out there that are not customs brokers, but I wouldn't say it's the norm. Here's a good question that um, the, the, in the age of COVID, we've, uh, we've, there's been a lot out there in terms of how containers are in, 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 uh, are in the wrong place and delays, et cetera. Can you give us a quick uh, overview of like the state of shipping today and how can a small business try to navigate that situation? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, COVID. Well, first of all, you know, for the last year, uh, to put it in, in, a, in a phrase, things have been a mess. And it's been a it's been a daily sort of mop up of, of the mess uh, that all freight forwarders and customs brokers and all that. And importers, for that matter, have had to uh, deal with this is, uh, you know, unprecedented to use sort of phrase um, a few years of doing this, uh, and, and that's a day. Uh, what COVID really did of how freight has moved because of a lack of passenger flights on the air freight side and um, decreased port activities on the ocean freight side and so forth. It, it, made, it created an imbalance of equipment and space globally. Um, the way we're combating it is carriers are finding ways to add capacity because it's in their best interest to do that they can get more cargo passenger flights and they put cargo up in the seats uh, that, that normally people would be in uh, which which are converted um i've never seen anything like that before uh, certainly cargo carriers on the air freight side have added more charter flights and things of that nature on the ocean freight side 
Uh, it takes longer to get more vessels and equipment in rotation, but certainly ocean freight carriers are leasing more containers to get into their system than they were at one time. The situation is better today than it was one year ago, but it's certainly not um, solved. Uh, these things are like an elephant in the room. When you try to turn them around, they don't, they don't, they don't uh, get solved quickly. It takes time. If the vaccine rollout globally happens the way everybody hopes it will, I would say by late summer to early fall of this year, we will see a bit more normalcy in the logistics uh, industry. And hopefully every month as we go in 2021, it'll get better. That's really where we stand right now. And it just requires working with your freight forwarder, looking at creative bookings, takes a little more time to get those bookings in place. Space is out there. We just have to work harder for it. Okay, we talk about exports, but there are uh, people in our audience that are interested in imports. So let's cover a question there. Does a freight forwarder generally offer all these services that you talk about, such as the service of a custom broker? You said yes. Or would an importer need to hire out all these different services? What does it cost for a freight forwarder who handles an umbrella of services such as this? So you, you can, uh, the, the answer to the question really is, you can do it one of two ways. You can work with a single company or maybe a couple of companies that you choose that offer all of these services. And they will, just like my company, will provide you with a quotation that itemizes those services, okay? Um, things like customs clearance fees, um, freight forwarder fees, certainly the freight charges are quoted using different carriers with different transit times. If a freight forwarder or customs worker is going to do a good job for you, get ready. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. They should ask you a lot of questions because if we understand the situation thoroughly, our job is to match you to the right service at the right price based on your needs and what the situation is. So you can, you can work with a company or a couple of them that provide a wide variety of these services. You can also say, I'm going to work with company X for freight forwarding but I'm going to work with company Y for customs brokerage. Then I'm going to have an export trading and packing company over here. Then I'm going to use an ins I'm going to buy my own cargo insurance policy. You can do these things individually. You don't have to work just with a forward on them. Many of our clients tell us that having a kind of a one-stop shop, one place to go is beneficial for them. Uh, they just have to keep track of less vendors, but you can do it uh, I, the other way as well. You know what, Paul? I think that's good. That'll we will uh, circulate the, the slides today to everyone who attended. Um, and Bill, if you'd like to yeah. share some additional, if there's other questions that I could answer even by email to someone, you know, I'd be happy to do that as well. Or I can answer them to you, Bill, and you can you can then, uh, you know, you can distribute the answers if you like. If we didn't get to everybody's question, right? And the 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 we can record the the Q and A in the chat and uh, distribute that. Okay. Yeah. Paul, thanks. Well done. Okay. Appreciate you know it. Thank we, you everyone for being here. <laughs> we've got a few more slides. Paul, I'm going to have Paul sign off. Okay. And I'll finish it up from here. Yep. Let me just stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right, everybody, just to follow up, if, if you do need assistance, there's the ITC, that's what we do. If you think in a general sense, if you wanna talk more about exporting, set up a time to talk and we can walk you through the process. There's, again, we can talk about, is your product ready to export? We can connect you, connect you with expo, uh, experts in the field. We can talk about your channels. We can talk with state or federal people and guide you every step of the way. We do have upcoming webinars at the International Trade Center. There's Freight Forwarding 201, where I think we will get into some examples and in the INCO terms and the C letters of INCO terms that are gonna be quite helpful, just how it all dovetails together or why that's the best idea for you and other topics in upcoming months. Okay, now going hard, uh, going international is hard work. We understand that, but it's good for your business. Again, we're here to help. There's my phone number, there's my email. We, I can connect you with Paul as well for freight forwarding issues. And the final is uh, if you'd like to provide some feedback, there you go. Uh, 
let us know about this program and what you thought. So I'll leave that on for 30 seconds. Again, Paul, well done. That's what we needed. I think just a good overview and, and, and takeaways, very uh, straightforward takeaways. And I think that's what's going to help our uh, audience. And we go from there. All right, everybody. Thanks for having me, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone.